No, it's I right. think she had a bad year or two. And then That's what I think. It's recording now. Okay. Bye, Jada. I'm on your in the frame. No. I'll be able to pull it up. I don't like being in the frame. Okay, no, yeah. no one go near this desk in case it just, <laughs> you know. If it falls over, that's it. Nobody will have it. I'm sure it'll be fine, right? No, it will break into a thousand pieces. See, the chair will catch it. Maybe. All right, let's get started with our 15, 17 minute lecture. As you know, we're on Unit 9. We all have a ton of stuff to do. Globalization, 1980 to 2022. Why circa 1980? With globalization, what's been going on the past few decades? 1980 is sort of the turning point year. Good word to use in essays. Watershed year, good word to use in essays, like the most important year in our time period. What's the big deal about 1980? The rise of the internet. The Defense Department of the United States of America uh, was doing research and actually came up with the World Wide Web, and now, of course, we use it for everything. If one thing is more important than anything else for globalization, it actually would be uh, the internet. Okay, I have come up with a thesis, mystery thesis statement on globalization. It's short, it's one sentence, and I think it's, I think it's a good one. Spencer, will you read it out loud, define globalization? To define globalization, it is a process of increasing the pace, the interaction of the world's people. Lots of P blank, but creates lots of A blank. Okay, so globalization is like the pace of interaction globally has picked up, and then there's two words I want to use that to describe that. On one hand, globalization, this increased technology, communication, the United States trading with China, diseases getting on airplanes and going all over, all this stuff, all these medical advances, vaccines that India helps us out, all this stuff creates a tremendous amount of potential. Lots and lots and lots of potential. That's a positive thing. Positive potential. But on the other hand, in this new era we're all living in, it also creates a tremendous amount of anxiety. More anxiety. I'd like to give a really, what I think is a really good example about this potential slash anxiety thing. This will be a test question. Because it's my thesis statement for the unit, this will be a test question. NAFTA. We all know what NAFTA is. North American, American Free Trade Agreement. NAFTA is when, is, is our, it has a new name, but let's just use NAFTA, everyone knows NAFTA. NAFTA is the process of removing economic barriers between Mexico, US, and Canada. Removing economic barriers so there's more free trade between those three countries. Remember from the other day, like what did knowledge-based companies want? They want free trade, liberalization, more movement and more goods and things like this. So attaching NAFTA to potential versus anxiety, one of the things we picked up, United States, we picked up from Mexico, that Mexico produces a lot of, they do a really good job, is fruits and vegetables, limes, avocados. Avocados, by the way, become so expensive that some of the Mexican drug cartels have been controlling the avocado trade. I'm not even joking, all right? Uh, tomatoes, limes, avocados, cantaloupes. So NAFTA comes into place. All the three presidents sign NAFTA, all right? And then Mexico gets to ship avocados, limes, tomatoes, etc. to the United States. No tariff is placed on it. The Mexican truckers just come right through. And you and I are happy because we're buying a much, much, much cheaper product, a good product for a much cheaper price. 300 million Americans are paying less money for limes, tomatoes, avocados, cantaloupes, watermelons, strawberries, etc. We like that. Yay, more money in our pocket. Lots of potential. Free trade is lots and lots of potential. On the other hand, where does the anxiety lie? What what important group of people in America anxiety has risen with my example? American, American farmers. Farmers are getting killed. 
because it's much more expensive to raise stuff here. But, and so that's how globalization works. Someone's going to benefit and someone's going to get hurt. But the, like, the belief is, it's not, I don't think it's like math, two plus two, you can prove it because it's controversial. But the thinking is, on net, the world will benefit because globalization, like capitalism, globalization, it chases cheap products. It chases cheap labor. Like, we don't build shirts in America, we send them to Vietnam, okay? Uh, cheap computer parts, we don't want, we want them somewhere else. So I just used one example, but like any product anywhere, like wherever it's getting produced the cheapest, that's where we're going. But what, like, but Mr. Reed, isn't that gonna put some American workers out of work? Yes, it does. What do we do with those workers who put out of work because uh, Vietnam can produce things cheaper than us, Cambodia can, Mexico can, India can, etc., etc., etc. We need to train those workers to do higher level jobs, knowledge-based jobs. We're moving to a knowledge-based, more knowledge-based economy. I think that information I just gave you is pretty darn important. Political globalization. Connor, thank you, number one. Define globalization. Oh wait, that. Um, what is? Um, I don't know. Try, try. Um, try. Balkanization. Balkanization. Or yeah. yeah. Or fragmentation mean. Okay, so a big, humongous political theme during this era is something called balkanization or fragmentation. There are three. Let's look at balkanization. Long fancy word. There are three peninsulas in Europe. There's the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, the Italian with Italy, and then the third peninsula in Europe is, one, two, three, the Balkan, Balkan, Balkan Peninsula. Peninsula. Greece, Macedonia, Yugoslavia, Serbia, Albania, blah, 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 all those things. Right, after World War II, there was one country there, I mean, Greece was always there, Yugoslavia. But because there's so many different ethnic groups living so closely, tightly knit, Muslims, Christians, Serbians, Herzegovinians. Remember that was the powder cake for World War I where the assassination took place? It's just like a hot ethnic area in the world. Yugoslavia broke up into six or seven countries. It balkanized. USSR, 17 different countries balkanized. I've shared this statistic before, and this is what, right? This fits balkanization fragmentation. We keep fragmenting politically. In the year 1900, there was 100 countries. In the year 2022, there's 212 countries. That is what balkanization is. The political trajectory is to break up, break up, break up, break up. The most recent country in the world is South Sudan. The country of Sudan has broken into half. North Sudan and South Sudan. East Timor broke away from Indonesia. Lam Lam Zwami, will you please read number two? Um, what happened on 9-11-2001? How did the USA react to attack on civil liberties? We all know what happened on 9-11, right? I was actually teaching WAP 9.30 in the morning, and we watched the second tower come down. You can believe that. I made a decision. I was like, yeah, I think it's okay. You guys are mature enough to watch this. Uh, everything changed in 9-11. Guys, most of American history, we have been super safe. We're a big country, we're a powerful country. We got the Canadians to the north of us. Who care the Canadians, whatever, they're wussies. They're like, you know, they're chopping wood and have flannel shirts and drinking syrup. They're not powerful. We have always dominated Mexico. And even more important than that, the two biggest oceans on either side of us have protected us. We've been a very safe, protected nation. That all changed in 9-11. I'll never forget that night, 9-11, I couldn't sleep. I walked outside, maybe midnight or one o'clock. It was just, you could hear a pin drop. It was just, uh, I walked, I couldn't sleep. And it was just surreal. I had never had such a weird feeling. Like I didn't know like what, what was gonna happen next? What direction were we going in? Is there gonna be another attack tomorrow? It was a feeling unlike anything I've ever had. All right, and, and since that time, we've had to deal with terrorism. A good bit. It's been kind of quiet, thank God, recently, the past few years, but it's still out there. We're still dealing with it. We spend billions of dollars to track it and monitor it. 
in that other, listen to this guys, in that other interesting class I teach, we are looking at a Supreme Court case right now where the FBI implanted three or four FBI agents as Muslims in a mosque to take the sermons and to spy on people. And it's actually, it is a case that it's not clear that they're going to be found guilty or government's going to be found guilty of, of civil liberties violations on American citizens. It's a really interesting case. So we have this terrorism thing. What's one huge change that has come about in America? We passed a lot of laws that give a lot of freedom to our government to listen to us on the telephone, to put plants in religious institutions, to, to challenge a lot of civil liberties and freedoms that would never have been challenged before then. Things have changed post 9-11 era. Economic globalization. We've already done multinational corporations, right? Companies are more beholden to stop their stock owners than to a state. They're not like, yay, America. They're like, yay, stockholders. I think everyone knows what OPEC is, right? OPEC is the group of countries in the Middle East that try to set oil prices. No, we don't like OPEC. Because when OPEC sets high prices, we got to pay a lot of money for gasoline. I mean, look, a lot of OPEC countries are allies. Like Saudi Arabia is the most important OPEC country. we very close with Saudi Arabia. But just think about this, guys. Here at Saudi Arabia, 90% of their income comes from oil. Would Saudi Arabia rather be selling oil at $100 a barrel or $10 a barrel? Hundred. If they're selling oil at hundred dollars a barrel, that country's rich. If it's selling it for ten dollars a barrel, they're hurting. So OPEC works together to set the price. They tinker with supply and demand because supply and demand sets the price of everything. They tinker with supply and demand. They put limits on each country how much they can produce. Our nation's addicted to oil. Oil is just there's wars. We're addicted to it. Like just knowing the importance of oil in our story is important during this century. Question number three, what is the World Bank? And if you'll type next to that the IMF, uh, International Monetary Fund, you can just put IMF, same thing. Okay, there's this thing called the World Bank or IMF in the world. It is a humongous bank, humongous, very lots of money. Most of the money in there is from the West. Let's say Uganda one day says, hey, we need to build a highway from Kigali, our capital, to our second biggest city. We don't have one. We need $50 million to do that. We don't have it. They go to the World Bank, the IMF, and say, hey, will you loan us $50 million to do this? And the World Bank says, yes, we will. Here it is. But your previous presidential elections were crooked. You need to run them like this. Cambodia needs to build a bridge, $10 million. They go to the World Bank. Here's your $10 million. And like, you know, you're not very democratic. You need to do this, this, and this. The World Bank, on one hand, has helped a lot of poor countries through the years. On the other hand, some people accuse the World Bank and IMF as modern day colonialism because we're dictating, the West is dictating how those countries run. It's, there's not a right or wrong, it's just a controversy. Spencer, have you ever heard of the World Bank, Raymond? Just curious. Uh, yes. A little bit. I, I thought maybe your debate research yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, number four, we, you know, what has happened to long distance communication transportation? Mm -hmm. You're already touching that, you know, planes, iPhones, everything's closer, everything's quicker, closer. This reach friends with three guys in Latin America. We can get on a plane to China tomorrow, all that stuff, right? Faster and quicker. Bree, will you please read question number five out loud? The Earth is flat. How has the internet lessened the importance of geographic distance? Tell my expert story. Okay. The Earth is flat. The Earth is flat economically uh, and in the labor market and jobs. Post-1980, there's been a really big change in jobs. I want you to listen. Here's my story. True story. And it will connect to this point. A few years ago, five or six years ago, I was in Colorado and I was riding my mountain bike. And I was at the top of a mountain. The town I was in was 10,000 feet high, Telluride. And then I went up about 2,000 feet. 
and my mountain bike hit a, there's a tree in the path, no big deal, that's a part of mountain biking, and it hit, but the tree was real wet, so my front tire uh, slid, in a, slid out like this underneath me, and this leg hit the tree like bam, 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 repeatedly, and each time my leg hit, it jammed wood up my leg really far, all the way to the other side, I'm not lying. So I took my shirt off and I, you know, tied it to try to stem the bleeding. Like I was 12,000 feet high, I stuck my little right leg down. I just like gravity, like I went all the way down to the hospital. When the hospital was like, because it was a small town, which is like a little one of the 24/7, you know, little places. And I went in there and they like treated me. They took a hose. They like it was a deep hole, gash, and they like hosed it out get all the forest gunk out and wood and all this stuff. They made a humongous mistake, like really a big medical mistake. I'm not joking. They sewed me up. Puncture wounds you don't sew up because you, ha you have to wait to get all the stuff out, otherwise you'll get an infection. So day two or three, I wasn't feeling good, I had a fever, I went back. I said, oh no, you're okay, it was a big puncture wound. You know, day five, it starts swelling up bigger and bigger. I have a fever, they're like, oh no, give it a couple more days. Day seven at midnight, this is a little gross. The infection had grown so big, the infection is pus, had grown so big and put so much pressure on it, it exploded through my stitches. It was disgusting, I know. My wife rushed me back to the hospital. They looked at it, I'll never forget, the person that looked at it got scared, their jaw dropped, and they said, you need to go to the nearest hospital right now. And they, my, my wife drove me all night the story will connect to this, I promise. <laughs> uh, drove me all night, and they looked at me, had emergency surgery, you know, they said, oh, they should have never sewed it up and all this stuff. And they had left, I'll show you a picture because I pulled the photograph up for it. They had left in my leg three pieces of wood over an inch big, literally, like this, in my leg for a week. So that's what, you know, causing, and they had, like, I remember when I woke up in my surgery, the doctor had them in a little, canister and shove it in me. I was like, oh my God. Uh, and so when all this is going on, I need a lot of x-rays, right? And so all these x-rays. And can you guys imagine surgery three or four nights in a hospital? That's tens of, for anyone, that's tens of thousands, a lot of money. So they, all these x-rays, my they like said, well, where do you want these x-rays to go? You have a choice, Mrs. Reed, my wife. Uh, we can look at them right here, but there's also, we need to give you this option. You can send them to India right here. And then so my wife said, oh, I want them to go to India. So they pushed a button. My x-rays immediately went to India where a totally well-trained Indian doctor looked at them, studied them, and wrote up like what needed to happen to me. Imagine what a doctor in the United States, called, like what's the salary of a doctor in the United States? 200,000 grand. What is the salary of a doctor in India? 15 grand, something like that. The earth is flat. Now, much work, lots of work with a touch of a finger can be done anywhere in the globe. Globalization chases cheap labor. We save lots of money by having a totally competent Indian doctor do some of my work. The earth, the earth is not flat. Economically, labor-wise, the earth is flat. And I'll make one more point about this and then I'll stop because I told you you can work for half a class. So when, when Mr. Reed was in high school, I kind of wanted to go to UT. I didn't go, my wife went to UT. I was leaning, and so you know what it took, y'all know what it takes to get into UT or any now, right now, you know, right? So to get into UT when Mr. Reed was in high school, I simply had to be in the top third of my class and make like an 1100 on the SAT. That's it, easy. I'm rel right, relatively easy. That, can you imagine that right now? You know, like is there how, you know, why is it so insanely difficult? My daughter's got in USC. They didn't get into UT. They weren't top 6%. They went to a private school. They would have been like the top seven kids. Why is it insanely hard now for you guys? Because of my story. When Mr. Reed was in high school, I was only competing against other American kids. You guys are competing against Chinese, Indian, Belgian, French, English, smart African kids, etc., for jobs all over the place. It's totally, completely different. I work out at Rice. I live right next to Rice University. I'm at Rice three or four days a week in the gym. I hear more Chinese than English. 
I'm not joking. Many college campuses have thousands of, it's like three or 400,000 Chinese kids, smart kids in the United States. Can I just ask you, do you guys, when I say the earth is flat economically, did my story make sense? Did you guys follow me? Thomas, does that make sense, the story about? All right. Is there any questions about that at all? I think it's, like I have to like, I have to say, I think like that point I just taught you is, you know, it's pretty insightful into like the way our world is going now. That concludes the lecture for today.